Hey guys, what's going on? It's Alexander Williamson here with the secret history of living inside your aquariums. All of them. So today we're going to be talking about something that obviously people new to the hobby really uh, should learn and it's just good information. But a lot of people who've been in the hobby a long time or maybe they're switching from cichlids to planted tanks or maybe it's just something you haven't thought about but you've kept fish a long time and it's just slipped your mind. But today we're gonna talk about why your cleanup crew, and by cleanup crew, I mean the term popularized probably by, you know, folks like uh, Dustin's uh, Planted Tanks, King of DIY, Aquarium Co-op, all the, all the great channels that you know and love that are big channels. Uh, they've been using this term a long time as well as uh, introductory books and things, but cleanup crew usually refers to your shrimp, your snails, your catfish or bottom feeding fish like auto sinkless uh, are kind of in there with plecos and quarry cats things like that so things that basically eat uh, detritus they're, they're secondary or tertiary decomposers or consumers of waste in your aquarium usually so algae they're still going to be a primary consumer they're going to eat the algae but when it comes to waste from your bigger fish they're going to be kind of a secondary or even tertiary consumer which means down the food chain if you look at the top and you've got carnivores and then omnivores and then you know bigger 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 at the top smaller at the bottom you've got food that is left over when you feed your other fish and just like in the wild if you have something like an oscar or an angelfish or even guppies you feed them a flake food it's usually a mix of uh both meat and plant uh contents and there's all sorts of foods to feed and we're going to talk about that but when you feed them a lot of it gets past them both by not being absorbed when they eat it the first time they digest it some fish species absorb a lot more than others some use the restroom and a lot of the same vitamins minerals nutrients and even like fiber and things that are in there come out the other end and that's where your shrimp and your snails help break it down into mulm which then is becomes a harmless byproduct over time and actually the nutrients that are still left in that that's what feeds all the plants and gives life in your tank and depending on what you want to do with it when you learn more and if you get into it deeper you can do all sorts of things like up the nitrates and make the water green water full of algae and these sorts of things by feeding extra you can cause your snail or shrimp populations to skyrocket by letting these things creep up or you can also keep those things under control. You can stop things like planaria and hydra outbreaks, uh, all sorts of pests um, that come along with overfeeding. So that is kind of the scope of what we're gonna talk about, but we're gonna jump in and we're gonna talk about, the, so we already know who we're talking about, but we're gonna talk about what we feed them, what they would eat in the wild, so what they, what they need versus what we give them and a nutritional profile of, you know, how often do you need to feed your shrimp? How often do you need to feed your pleco? And while we have videos on each species individually, I wanted to talk about the cleanup crew as a whole because the cleanup crew is an essential part of any fully working ecosystem. They're gonna eat the algae off your plants, they're gonna eat the stuff you don't want, and so they're a critical part of the aquarium and of anybody's planted tank if you want it to be balanced and running for years on end uh, and actually producing real soil that's fertile and that keeps giving back to your aquarium. So beyond that, we've got a whole bunch of tips and tricks here that will hopefully help you from one, having to clean the filter as often, two, having high nitrates and doing so many water changes, three, having fat or unhealthy creatures, uh, and for also not starving your creatures. You will have uh, adequate food, but there's lots of little things to take account of, and that's what we're gonna take a look at right now. So let's jump into all that, and let's go. All right, guys, we have a community tank here, and we're talking about cleanup crews. So who do we have in the cleanup crew in this tank here? We've got the Happy Lemon Pleco going ahead and eating the uh, biofilm off the glass. Now, a lot of ancestrous, let's talk about 
what each of these main categories of fish or members of the cleanup crew do before we get into anything else because you may have a cleanup crew that is hired for completely the wrong jobs maybe you should just be keeping these creatures because you like these creatures but not for what they're cleaning because if we look carefully what are we what do we have on the cleanup crew here we've got a siamese reticulated algae eater this guy has the diamond on the tail and when you talk about algae eaters this is the one you want for eating both hard algae off of plants like diatomaceous algae but more so for eating anything that's going to be filamentous algae or hair algae as well as even some blackbeard algae. These Siamese algae eaters don't get the flying fox, they're kind of mean. These guys do get big though, however, and they also eat algae best when they're very young. So you're going to want to make sure to get these guys when they're young and maybe get two or three of them ideally for say a 30, 40 gallon tank or larger and they will help you control the algae growing. They'll eat it if there's nothing better to eat. And that's really the story with all the cleanup crew. And as we go down the list, here we have an Ancestress. This is a lemon pleco, and you can see it's about to use the bathroom. And just a little side note or tip here, when you see them using the bathroom, it's coming from a ginormous stomach that is a spiral, like a Cinnabon. If you look at the inside of its stomach there almost, there is a spiral. We'll try to find a better shot of that on another one. In fact, even on the little teeny babies that are in here that that mother uh, ancestress gave birth to, you can see the little belly in there with the little spiral. Well, that's all algae, biofilm, and anything it eats. However, your cleanup crew, you hired them to do a specific task, and that's to eat a specific thing that's happening or growing in your tank. So if you need biofilm and little algae, uh, soft algaes for the most part, or to uh, preemptively clean the algae on the glass, then your ancestress, your autosynclus, they're great for that. However, if you need something to get in between the hard to reach places, check out what this guy is doing. Now that this guy's six inches long, he can't reach in between those places and he is going to be able to eat the algae still as he gets bigger, but he's going to tear everything up as he gets older as well. So you want to decide on a cleanup crew that maybe doesn't do that. You can see here where he's actually harmed this plant here, the Bacopa. He's actually eaten holes in it because he was a little rough on it. So this means that maybe I need to be feeding this guy a little bit more. I got him because I had algae and I wanted it to, to go away. Well, he did that job. Now I need to take care of my cleanup crew. So it's always gonna be a balance with your cleanup crew that you either are giving them their special food that they need and keeping all the other food away from them as much as possible or you're going to not be feeding them at all and they're going to be using the tank for sustenance so in the wild as a whole what do these creatures eat these cleanup crew well as we said they're all going to be eating the stuff that your stars of the show may not be eating and i apologize for the reflection here but no matter what the tank is whether it's a large community tank or over here we've got a really densely planted jungle tank you can get a cleanup crew and you'll have different members for different tasks now for this size tank i don't want a six inch siamese algae eater so i've got a little auto sinkless here working on the glass for me and he eats aufuchs, which are the colonies of bacteria and goodies that live on surfaces. It's uh, bacteria, fungi, uh, little teeny plankton and algae, all sorts of things like that that grow on those surfaces. And in the wild, that's what they're going to eat as well. And for the most part, autosynclases are one that are very safe to put in with shrimp and other things. They're going to keep doing their job. Uh, and they have specialized in being a sucker fish that only really uses their specialized little mouth to uh, hoover up all the other things that are on the glass or that are on various surfaces. 
The same is going to go with, say, nearite snails. Now, nearite snails, you can get these little miniature zebra ones, you can get horned ones, you can get red racers, but they are not going to reproduce. So you don't need to worry so much about overfeeding them. However, if you want them to do the work that you hired them for, bought them for, which is eating hard algae as well as diatomaceous algae, then you're going to want to make sure that, you know, the places that grows, rocks and the glass, are getting enough light and your water has enough nitrates and phosphates, which usually we're trying to keep down, mind you, but enough of that so that it's growing so they have food. Now, if the goal is to get rid of all that, then obviously they don't have food, the food that they evolved to eat, and so we need to give them something else. So what should we be giving them? And remember, these specialized foods are not being eaten by all the other critters in the tank. So the problem with the cleanup crew is while we have lots of different members, and here you can see we've got a little, another little lemon pleco that's a middle-aged one, unlike the adult, its parents in the other tank. But we've also got snails down here. We've got ram's horn snails, and we've got... Uh, uh, Malaysian trumpet snails, and we even have some mystery snails from the other room that I'm growing out in here. So, what do these guys need slash eat? Well, they're going to be eating all the same things that we've already mentioned, but their primary job is going to be actually cleaning up the junk on the bottom. So, when you've got Malaysian trumpet snails, you've got ram's horn snails or pond snails, the, uh, the little uh, pond or bladder snails, those are all going to be eating basically detritus, uh, decaying plants. So if you have a plant that you've trimmed and it has a spot that is decaying, they will clean that up so it doesn't deteriorate into ammonia. And up here again, the nearite, we've got another nearite working, and I just want you to see that little mouth moving and you can actually see it scraping away and here you can see little spots of algae when I get the focus out but that's what it would be eating in the wild off rocks and hardscapes would be this kind of stuff and it's got these little teeth you see the little scraper teeth little bone plate thing that it can get around little hard surfaces but it's gonna need that food too now it's also gonna need something so that it can grow its shell and so that it can have those little bony teeth that are so hard that scrape away the hardest algae that normal, normally only a razor blade is gonna get to. So, what are we looking at here and, and how do we do that? Now, I wanna show you another little tip and trick while it's in sight well. You see how this snail right here has a deep hole right in the center of its spiral? Well, that means that this tank is only allowing that snail to grow at an extremely slow rate. Normally, we'll take a look in the other room. Normally, these snails don't have such a deep uh, donut hole, and they have more of kind of, like this one here, more of a generalized spiral. You can see another one with a donut hole back there. So it means that they're not getting enough food. So we had a big explosion of babies, and then now they don't have enough food. Well, why is that? I mean, I see algae. Ah, we hired them for the wrong task again. And same with the Malaysian trumpet snails, which are staying small. So if you have too many snails and you wanted them to eat excess food, that's what they're really for, is the excess food and plants. Now, other than the nearite snails, the nearite snails are going to eat the hard stuff on hardscape. But the other snails, pretty much all the other snails, they're going to eat whatever you feed and falls to the bottom. Just like when you see a cow uh, eating and it's eating a bunch of grass and stuff like that, you get out to the cow pasture and you look at the cow, you look at the cow patty that it's left us and that cow patty is gonna have a bunch of grass in it because they don't digest it very well. So they actually end up leaving a lot of the nutrients and even the actual grass you can see in their waste. Well, that's why we hired those snails and the other cleanup crew or haven't gotten rid of them, may be the case. Here's another one of those little snails. But if we give them too much food, it's just gonna create a feedback loop and they will keep growing. So 
you want to think about that but in this tank you can see we don't have a ton of those snails so it means we're not overfeeding and the thing with all these creatures that I've shown you and uh, all the shrimp and other creatures that are also a part of this is they will eat whatever you're feeding the other fish that sounds good on the menu. They are naturally evolved to eat the thing with the most vitamins, with the most calcium if they're a little crustacean, uh, and with the most you know minerals and everything and calories per gram or per however much you want to measure it by a pound of food and so that means that if you have this high protein omega-3 fancy color flakes that you feed to the little fish up here when it falls past that's what they want and they are going to skip out on the whole salad bar that you hired them to eat if they have something else to eat so you need to kind of train them to eat what they naturally eat and not allow them to eat these other things. So how do we do that? Well, it goes back to looking at the creature and knowing its habits. You need to know when you look at these creatures, one, it's good to know what they look like when they're full and healthy, like this fish here. It's got a big old, you know, even lines, no sunken belly. If you start to see your fish having sunken sides at all or just looking really skinny, then you know that something's up. And once you get to know the species that you're keeping, you'll know when something's up. You'll know, you know, when a guppy has a sunken belly or a tetra has a sunken belly. And also the other thing is the same area where they go to the bathroom, you will see little white or red squiggly worms sometimes in between meals if they have some sort of, um, some sort of parasite and worm in their gut which could be causing them to uh, be deficient. Because in that case, you could feed them all the right things, but they could still be losing weight. So always keep an eye on your critters and get to know your critters. In here with all these other big fish, these gouramis and everything, we still have a bunch of shrimp. And they're hired basically in this case to eat the little teeniest cracks and crevices where we're gonna get algae, we're gonna get biofilm, and we're gonna get, we are gonna get some of the other algaes too. And here we've got, you know, some uh, some blackbeard algae in between the uh, the rhizomes here on this um, bulbitis fern. But for the most part, it's staying in check because this guy will eat it when it gets too big. However, if he has food left over because we fed too much at mealtime to the other guys, he's going to eat that other food and then he'll ignore the black beard algae or the green hair algae or whatever it is that you hired them for. So like I said, get to know these creatures, know what they eat in the wild, and know what they'll eat in the aquarium, and then also try to keep the other food away from them. Now there's a lot of ways to do that and I, we'll talk about that in just a moment. So keeping away the food from the critters you don't want having it at specific times. Well, the best way to do that is to get good food for those other critters that are specialists. So let's say that you want to feed all these little tetras, your endlers, your your guppies, your angelfish, whatever it may be. So you want to get them a floating food that'll stay up high, up on the top, where they can all come and eat. And usually the general rule of thumb is within two to three minutes, whatever they don't finish, if, if they don't clear it all out, there's still food left over in two to three minutes, maybe four minutes, then you've, you've fed too much, definitely because your fish should pretty much always eat everything you put in the aquarium if you're feeding them the right small portions. Now going back to talking about critters that we've observed and how they act in the wild, we know that a lot of these fish can go days, weeks, months without eating uh, certain things. You know, a lot of them can go without eating period for several weeks. And it's because they get trapped in little pools or they have slow metabolisms. They're also all cold-blooded creatures. So they're, well, they're not all, not all fish are, but probably all the ones we're dealing with are. And they're cold-blooded and so they can slow down their metabolism. And the other thing that we need to keep in mind with that metabolism is how warm is the water and how long are the lights on. Because here we've got all these little gobies in here and they're one of my specialist fish in here. 
So you want to think to yourself, what are my specialist fish and what do they need? So what are their special diets that these gobies need? Well, these gobies, they need biofilm, and I can't go to the store and buy that. So they literally need the, the biofilm left over. I can't have too many cleaners like the nearites or other critters that are going to eat that biofilm off the rocks completely, or they won't have any food. And there's, there's options like rapashi, or um, sometimes you'll find one frozen food or something that works. But generally, it gets really hard with some of these um, oddball or rarer, more unique uh, fish in the aquarium. So let's take a look at a few other aquariums, some shrimp, and let's talk about when you're intentionally keeping those shrimp and snails, the special foods that you can get for them and feed them, but what, how we can keep the cleaning crew in balance. And the last thing I want to show you guys in these, these tanks is how that algae eater, the Siamese algae eater, damaged these leaves here. But over here you can see thanks to those snails, rather than the plant dying and just producing ammonia and whatnot, in, instead of leaving these leaves with holes where they can't even photosynthesize like you see, the snails have trimmed them to the edge. So, And we can see new growth growing actually right there at the top. So the snails in this case, as well as the little baby plecos, they've done their job. And while we're talking about what they're eating and the job they're doing, you also want to make sure that if you have a pleco like a zebra pleco or like a, um, a, a leopard frog pleco, which I have five or six of in here, you want to make sure that you know what they're eating because some plecos like Ancestris may eat predominantly biofilm and vegetation uh, as well as fiber and wood, some other catfish and plecos only eat wood or they only eat meat. And in the case of the leopard frog plecos, they eat meat. And so we need to make sure that they have a food at the bottom at night when they're awake to eat that meat and uh, to get them the nutrients they need. Otherwise, they're just gonna eat the other stuff uh, that, that it's coming down for them and it's not gonna be enough, because ideally, we don't want it floating down. Ideally, the quarry cats and the snails and the shrimp in here are gonna clean up anything that gets past the top level. We're gonna feed floating food at the top, maybe a couple pellets that fall to the middle of the tank. Maybe we get some uh, fluval bug bites, uh, cichlid formula or tropical fish formula. And then you've got the gouramis and the other fish. The cichlids can feed off that while the little fish are at the top. And then at night, just like in the wild, we're going to want to feed the specialists uh, that come out, our cleanup crew. That way, in the day, they will actually do their job. So let's take a look, like I said, at some special circumstances in the other room real quick. All right, so here is a situation where I am specifically growing out Malaysian trumpet snails. See them all in the glass? For my puffers and just because they're really good at turning the substrate and soil and other tanks. But I'm also growing these Malawa shrimp. And so I want the most shrimp I can have in this tank uh, without there being an issue. And if you're curious how many shrimp you can fit in an aquarium, uh, the answer is basically as many as you'd like. They will slow down reproduction a little bit if they're too crowded, but as long as they have food, they pretty much keep reproducing. And these Malawa caradina shrimp, uh, these guys are awesome algae eaters, and I use them, like you saw in the other room, I use them in all my community tanks, and so I specifically breed them in this specialized tank. This tank that gets a diet that's different than all the other tanks. Now, back to a community tank, just because it's right here, we've got another nearite snail. You can see all the gunk and the, the crud, the hard algae and slimy algae that are on the walls of this tank. Well, that's why we have the nearite snails, and that's what they're doing. They're eating that. They're going around like a little uh, Roomba robot and cleaning that for us. Down here in this tank, we've got different lighting. We've got plants that block the lighting. We've got loaches that actually intercept a lot of the food. 
that falls while we're feeding these top dwelling fish. And another little tip is you have a cleanup
at the top above where even those top loving fish can get them and they're eating where the algae is growing the most so in this tank the, si the Siamese algae eater the uh, plecos the other options like that don't quite work well enough for me because I need something to get in between all these little spaces and something to get up at the top there so it tends to be in this tank a bunch of shrimp and a bunch of snails just remember you got to give them enough hiding spots from those fish but yet again as we had them with angelfish and cichlids there's more cichlids that they're with there's quarry cats and so on so you really can mix these creatures more than a lot of people think you can as long as you've got your your ingredients balanced now the last thing I'm gonna say about if you're purposefully raising shrimp like you know like something really pretty like these red uh, you know used to be called cherry shrimp and this one's actually having trouble so this is good that I noticed this so its shell looks like it may not have enough calcium it we may need to harden up the water it's either that or it's just about to molt so we'll watch that and we'll make sure that they start to look better but part of it's the algae on the outside of the glass but you can see that the discoloration and how it's not consistent that's not what we want to see in most shrimp and it could be that that shrimp's unhealthy or it could be that the whole tank needs help and so we look around and yet again it has to do with knowing the species in your care that shrimp's fine this shrimp's fine this shrimp's fine and here was a perfect example of that tail margin I was talking about you can see that it's getting it's getting that outside exoskeleton loose and it's gonna shed soon and that's why you can kinda see that clear margin that milky margin all around it now if that margin was really milky and and, uh, and foggy looking to the point where it was obscuring the color of the shrimp really quite a bit then we would know okay the water's too hard so we can scale that back and that's true for if it's a cleanup crew or if you're specifically raising these cleanup crew creatures on their own doesn't matter it's it's the same cue either way and so the same is true if they don't have any of that I mean in that case it leads us to believe well maybe this one's falling apart because it doesn't have enough of the hardness period because everyone else is doing really good so it's either this shrimp or we might be a little on the soft side because we know we do a lot of water changes in this tank so it's something to adjust and you can use your snails, you can use your shrimp, you can use all of your creatures in every tank if you know them well and observe them daily. You can notice when something's different. You can notice if someone has worms, you know, if someone's got uh, little red squigglies coming out of where they go to the bathroom uh, or little white ones, you know they may have worms. And down here where we've got a bunch of plecos, I always check to see that they're when they're going to the bathroom that they're castings out of that little Cinnabon swirl of a belly that it looks even and consistent and that it kind of comes out as a as a rope of whatever color food I've been feeding them now if it comes out you know some lighter clearish color then we know that there's trouble going on that there's something that is probably parasitic that's in their belly taking nutrients or they could be stressed um, and that they're passing that it's it's basically means that it's mucus and so if that continues then you'll definitely want to keep an eye out to see if if they start getting sunken in looking or having issues uh, holding on weight and same for all the fish in that tank so all your cleanup crew rather than just being a cleanup crew they're also barometers for so many things and so are so many fish especially the ones that you can count on the ones that you know well that you've seen a million times and that you understand well you know guppies and endlers like these guys up here um, they're all gonna tell you something different about the water conditions and it's all important information that you can get just by knowing your critters now the other thing is that a lot of these guys like I mentioned they feed at night and so with creatures that feed at night we've got the varied diet and heading back into the other room we've got the varied diet that we're gonna give them which is great but we also want to make sure that the food that we're giving them is 
full of the nutrients they need. So you can go and get specialty foods, like I said, like Rapashi uh, Bottom Scratcher or Rapashi Morning Wood, kind of funny names, for your plecos and things like that. And that is especially if you're breeding the plecos or keeping uh, those quote-unquote traditional cleanup crew critters as their own uh, stars of your tank. However, if they're your cleanup crew, don't give them a taste of the good life all day. Have something that cleans up all the stuff that's left over on the bottom, like your snails or whatnot. But ideally, have it be the fish as the food settles. Have it targeted at which fish are at whatever level. And then hopefully your other fish, like here's a quarry coming up to graze mid-level, and it's actually picking at some of this algae on here to see if there's anything that it wants to eat. Now, some people may say, oh no, your fish are starving, they're desperate. No, they're foraging, and that's what they do in the wild. So I wanna encourage you guys to continue to know your fish, know your plants, know your water chemistry, and this will all help in allowing your cleanup crew in a community tank like this to actually be a cleanup crew and not just be a burden or an explosion of snails. This is literally about three or four days of feeding away from being an explosion of snails if I let it. And so I have to know to be really careful not to overfeed. And so, uh, or I have to have more of the cleanup crew. And I don't want more of the cleanup crew because that they're not the feature of this tank. So these little gobies all running around are, and the the autos are, the the uh, the other creatures are. But thank you so much for watching, and I hope this encourages you to get excited about getting to know your critters. And if you like this long format, in depth wordy kind of podcast formatted information i highly encourage you to click the little bell so that you'll uh, turn on notifications and find out next time i have a video coming out a couple times a week have a great guest on or something every month and uh, do live streams twice a week as well so if you want to be a part of that click that and also hitting the like button always helps spread the information the knowledge so that we can encourage our friends and fellow uh, aquatic <laughs> enthusiasts, aquarium enthusiasts, to take the best care of their critters as possible. Thanks so much, guys. I will talk to you later. Hit the like button on the way out if you feel like it, if I earned it for you. And I'll talk to you next time on The Secret History, Living in Your Aquarium. Goodbye.